the artist is running a little late, and Michelle could not be here tonight, so I'll be reading on her behalf, and I just got it, so I might fumble over my words, so please forgive me. But I'm very excited to introduce you to all of these ladies. Um, I had this exhibit in mind just over a year ago, and I've watched all these women work, and although their work is very different, they play off of each other so well. Um, they all work very intricately, it's all details, um, and some of them are big, but there's so many details and beautiful intricacies in all of their work, and I couldn't be more pleased with this exhibit, and so honored to work with each of you. So thank you for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Likewise. <laughs> so Michelle, um, if you're not familiar with her, she is just a genuine soul. She's a dentist by day and an artist by night. Um, here. Um, working with wood offers a sensation all its own. It is a medium I fell in love with while living in southern Brazil. It is tactile, colorful, aromatic, and though abundantly available, each piece is singular. It also holds a challenge. How to know this material so naturally that it acts like my brain, my heart coming through in the wood. My early work consisted of utilitarian pieces, leaves carved in MDF, then cast in aluminum. I was happily working on saucers and platters when a couple of young architects pulled me in my depth with a request for a 14-foot panel for their architectural work. I had small children at the time, and the minimalism of Rio blocks was a source for inspiration. We, we create from what we know. Another terrifying invitation followed immediately after this time for the local architecture and engineering club for a show alongside a renowned Brazilian artist, Jose Goncalves. I began using the assemblage process out of curiosity to see my work and I could dialogue with his. My mentor at the time, a generarian master craftsman, <laughs> suggested using only the cross-cut view as I glued small pieces together, forming a composition on a piece of furniture made for the show. Goncalves became enthusiastic about the potential of this medium and suggested that I take it to the it took, take it off the furniture and put it on the walls. An international move later, I was able to set up a studio here in town, again with encouragement from my family and friends, who helped offset some of the startup costs. That was followed by an incentive and mentoring from friends like Cor Karen Corey, Gundy, Cottonwood staff, Abby. <laughs> 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 Art might persist, but seldom thrives in a vacuum. The completion of a piece can feel very complicated. Many times I wanted to throw one under the deck or cut it up and use it as firewood. Today I understand the work of an artist is to break her own heart. Follow the, tri the tangle of questions, push the edges, find the splendors, soften tender curves. As the mind ponders, the heart's joys lose Losses and bewilderment, the eyes and fingers work selecting textures, colors, figures, and lines. This series reflects the process of letting go. Loss exposes intricacies and fracture lines which explode into thickets of perplexities. The palette used in the thicket in five minutes <clears throat> is from a collection of leaves gathered on a blustery walk on a fall day. As a poet wrote, fall is the deciduous reminder to let go. If I cannot surrender something freely, it becomes lost to me. I just end up with lifeless, dusty, decomposing pain. No beauty can be laid bare or, or inspired. And then the final piece, all is well, represents the commitment, serenity, and freedom of release. Hi everyone, I'm Deborah Shenning. I am an interdisciplinary artist. And what that means for anybody who's wondering, um, I use a wide variety of art mediums to support my research-based practice, pretty much. And so I do everything from um, textiles to tapestries to sculpture, um, interactive installation, large scale public sculpture, a little bit of everything. So um, that's me. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Ashley Anderson. So my stuff is um, basically all, pretty much just all gold pieces in the show from right next to Abby. Very nice arm way, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I am also an interdisciplinary artist. Um, so it, I do work in a range of materials, but conceptually, pretty much the idea that undergirds the entire practice is how temporal materials, or just the nature of materials which are temporal, can communicate something transcendent. So that relationship, whether or not it's like the temporal being a human life and how we engage with the world and just like the arc of history 
That's really intriguing to me, things that just are constants. They have consistently been here. So that's part of the reason why I use gold a lot. It's in the ground, it's been here since time began. And so I love that I'm using that type of material to communicate something that is divine, absolute. It can't be destroyed. And I love that. So it's again, in, within our history and culturally, it often represents things that are constant. Um, I use things in contrast to that material that represent things that are fragile or temporal. So like the eggs. The eggs are kind of a relatively recent addition to my practice in the last two years. And so they're, they've been really beautiful because they also they break, so they're fragile. Um, but eggs also historically, they are the origin of life. And so there really is this beginning, this end, this whole arc of the human existence um, and how fragile we are. And so it's been really beautiful to see that kind of transpire. But yeah, the one on the far left was actually a collaboration with Deborah, which is really, really exciting. Um, Cause she went and she, well, you can talk about all your whites. She's collected white uh, wool yarn throughout all of her travels. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it, all of those are white, just depending on different countries. And then the wooden block that I have behind it is my great, great grandmothers. And so that was passed down. And so just this idea of legacies and histories and how our family, how we fit in our family and then how our families fit in again to this idea of culture, um, you know, just humanity as a whole. But um, yeah, it's well, been- I, I just wanna say something real quick. Oh yeah. That piece made me think a lot about just like the inherited streams of consciousness that we all mm -hmm. end up with. Some of it's ours, some of it isn't. But when we were working together on that piece, I thought a lot about how there's this tradition of passing down cooking and weaving primarily to women. So it was interesting that you and I kind of sat down on a Thursday and we're like, hey, let's do a clap, and came together four days later. Yeah, we pretty much had it done within a week. <laughs> I will say, though, we meet together every week yes. for eight years. So yeah. there was a lot of prep that went in behind that, that thing. But there's a lot of beautiful things. But yeah, overall. That's basically my practice in a nutshell. And we'll talk about how it fits in with the idea. We love this album. <laughs> my name's Margaret Kasahara, and I have these four pieces to the show. I am also a interdisciplinary artist, I think. <laughs> yes. But I have recently been focusing more on what I call these notations, which are these small mixed media drawings on my paper. Uh, I call them notations because I am making note of my thoughts and feelings, specific moments of time, and just the passage of time. Um, they're very much based on just my identity, just everyday life, um, what it means to be alive in this place and in this time. Um, so I like to incorporate everyday objects and familiar objects uh, because those are the things I run across in my life. In addition to that, oh, oh. in addition to that, um, everybody here probably can recognize these objects. And and in that, not only is there that the beauty of that physicality that you all see, but also that it's recognizability. And so you know that. And, and I'm already kind of developing a relationship with you and opening it up. As a conversation, which with the viewer, so that's very important to me, and that's central to my practice. Mm -hmm. Is trying to find humanity and sharing our lives that we have together in this time. Um, hi, I'm Wendy Mike, and my work is the figurative work. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> the cringe. <laughs> so that's kind of hard to miss. It's sort of spread around the room, um, and. I'm also an interdisciplinary <laughs> artist, but um, my, my work is just interdisciplinary in terms of the materials I use, but I was also trained as a singer and a dancer and an actress, which certainly informs what I do. Um, the body in motion has been the thing that has been uh, exciting to me for quite a number of years, and I'm not done yet. Um, I long ago began making, well, first of all, I was trained as a painter. So finding myself as a sculptor, although it was obvious maybe to a lot of people around me, wasn't um, something that I embraced until I was living here. I, I did my uh, art training in New York City. And um, so that was kind of a big surprise. But one of the things I found with sculpture is that 
the dialogue that I have with the sculpture is such that I kind of know when it's done. And with painting, I never knew when it was done, and I had a tendency to kill it by overworking it, you know. But sculpture, to me, has like a sort of a natural stopping point. Um, that said, you know, as I said in my statement about intricacy, to me, intricacy is irresistible. So I kind of can't help but like just get just a little more, you know, one more wrinkle or one more thing, you know, just going back into a piece and making it more and more specific and intricate. Um, but I began doing sculpture a long time ago with really unconventional materials, um, such as fabric and paper and then packing tape. I've done a lot of work with packing tape. Um, and I think it's, again, out of that idea that, um, one, the body is, I don't want it to be heavy. I don't want it to be made out of bronze. I want it to have life and movement and, um, and energy. And also, I just sort of reject the notion that sculpture has to be made out of you know, marble or bronze or whatever. Um, again, what I would call a female sensibility. And also because as an artist, I never could afford to work in that stuff anyway. So a, a lot of my use of materials comes from a kind of a necessity is the mother of invention for sure. Um, a love for throwaway materials. So all of the materials in the fabric are all um, from things I've gotten from the art and, you know, from, um, yeah, scars from thrift stores. This one, in terms of legacy, is the little white one here is made out of a pillowcase that my grandmother gave her my mom. And um, so that's, you know, very much, I love to work with materials. And again, materials in the way of telling a story. And it's a really a herstory. You know, it's so associated fabrics, associated with often with women, and, and fabrics often have like a whole historical, like they tell a story, the costumes of different nations and all that kind of stuff. So that, that stuff fascinates me. Um, so that's, I guess that's all I have to say right now. <laughs> Thank you. And? Hi, I'm Karen Corey. Thank you for being here, all of you. And my apologies for being delayed. Um, so um, to Wendy's point, I'll pick up on um, the accessibility of materials is paramount to me as an artist. Um, that it's not something that's out of reach or something that we have to go to an art supply store and you know, spend $30, $40 on, say, one tube of paint, mm -hmm. so, which is easily the case. Um, and it's prohibited, you know, when you get into that, unless you just dedicate, you know, all of your funding to that, you know, all of your wages and all of it to that. So accessibility was really um, important to me as far as materials. So I do the same thing. I go and, and thank goodness there's been, I guess, a turn in um, the acknowledgement of low art becoming high art. Um, and that's where I think, you know, kind of, you know, what I, I try to, to to work with, you know, something that's just accessible. Um, also, um, a big thing for me that has driven me always, not always, I'm, I was always, um, not always this way. Um, I was kind of an art snob, I would say, in my formal education. So I have my undergraduate degree is in um, painting, ceramics, art history, and then um, I went on to graduate school and then did um, a studio practices MFA and it was not until I was married for the second time and had children under feet immediately <laughs> and my husband had two children and I all of a sudden became a mom and I realized, wow, no wonder women create and make craft. And so craft became a paramount part of my, my vision and my 
um, what I embraced, you know, I was raising children and then pregnant, and I was like six o'clock, I'm making dinner, and I'm ready for bed, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I thought graduate school was hard. <laughs> so, the domestic has been a huge um, informative bit in, not just a bit, it's been huge in my um, creative practice. And I've never, um, there was a time, I would say, early on that I wanted, you know, like, I was thinking, oh, I just want to be an artist. But then I was like, wait, that just seems so lonely in that studio you know, without a family and without other aspects of life and just concentrating on this this creative mode. And so I was always driven to have family, and I had family. And But it really made me realize and appreciate what um, the domestic world is and what it involves and um, what it is to decide to become that blue chip artist or that artist that is going to create in the realm of a working family in the world. And that's what I chose. So. Did you all come together because of Abby or did you uh, seek each other out and bring the show? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Some of us knew each other yeah, before. We all, we all knew each other. Uh, yeah. It really is amazing that Abby was able to see this vision, mm -hmm. select us, mm -hmm. and really not know what we're going to drop off, <laughs> and then curate it and look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I told you the thing, intricacy. That was just a word. And we did right. work together that was collaborate yeah. really beforehand, so yeah. that's pretty impressive. So intake was fun. Yeah, it's like, that. ooh. <laughs> I found it very difficult. I had never been, um, it was kind of like picking a word out of a hat, kind of, and working to that. So it was like kind of a designer curation, I'll call it, you know? So, um, yeah, that was definitely an experience for me, rather than, you know, I'm used to being in... Um, I've not been in a lot of group shows when I was younger, more, but um, more where the people are selected and you're juried in, you know, you're juried in, you're selected, and then there's a title, a curatorial title that they come up with. So to have that title up front was, was interesting, you know, as an artist to work it was it, like I said kind of a designer curation so to have a word it's like a writing prompt you know when you're in you know composition 101 and you're like okay I'm gonna give you this and it was it was sort of took me back and I was like okay what are we <laughs> so it, it took it took a little bit for me to think about intricacy and for me intricacy I'm very minimal and reductive in my work, these are a little more, I think, collectively decorative, but um, it was it was hard for me to find that um, minimal reductive alignment for myself with the word intricacy because I kept thinking complicated. You know, intricate. I have a question. It's a part question, part comment, observation. So, I think in your in all of your shared practice, there's a certain physical intricacy to the work you're doing. But conceptually, it, I'm curious to hear which of you had works in process that you saw the connection to the theme and refined it and what you brought to for Abby to curate. And then we can see the intricacy of the concepts of what you're working with. But then also, it sounds like you maybe, Karen, created specifically for this. So then you were kind of almost reverse engineering, right? Is that right? Yes. And so I was just wondering for all of you if you could share how much was this ongoing established practice and what was new that you tried to bring to this specific, to these specific works? 
Well, I know for me, I, I <coughs> it's very interesting to hear you talk about that the word was like more so a roadblock for you in your practice. Because for me, within my practice, I really love etymology. And so if I'm curious about an idea, I will begin usually constructing a body of work or figuring out what I want to do by going and looking up the definition of that word. And then I go and I pull out all of the, the research elements. So you're going into art history, you're going into symbology and all those things, and then just the essence of materials and how that relates to that word. So for me, it was almost the opposite because it felt very natural to the way I work anyway. Um, regarding what I had, I had most of my stuff um, in progress and process. I, because intricacy is such a huge theme, I call it the spiritual language of the ordinary. For people, when I start talking about temporalities and transcendence and they freak out, it's essentially the kind of like the best basic statements. Mm -hmm. um, and so domestic sphere comes into play. Um, but the, the collaboration that you and I did was very specific to this exhibition and trying to figure out how we as individuals come into this. Um, I've always viewed intricacy like as a spider web that exists in the world. And so that all those little things that are ordinary are when you pay attention, you understand how everything's connected. And so, which is why my things are all minimal. Um, but with that piece specifically, we're looking at family history. So we wanted something that was specific for the show, not just coming out of our, our regular practice, which the rest of my pieces specifically are that. Now I have, I, when we were given the prompt, I kind of, it was like a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. I just kind of did the same thing. I looked at the definition and I was like, okay, where does this fit in with my practice? And I, at the time, I was working on a textile of the tapestry um, pieces around the corner. And I had to give like a one sentence of like, what did intricacy mean for me? And I think I wrote something like, you know, fiber work. Um, brings intricacy, subtle and not so subtle elements into it, and that's what I really appreciate about fibers coming into my practice. But the sculpture behind everyone um, is titled Pounds, and if we were to talk about intricacy as far as hum human condition, then I feel like that piece is more about human condition. And um, the materials I chose are typically out of the domestic setting, so that's pegboard and you can find that in the garage or in craft rooms. And I was thinking a lot about like themes of mother's milk and the value of mother's milk mm -hmm. in contrast to um, the potential earning income, stream of income that working mothers have potential for. You know, so you're, you have this battle between choosing work and family. Mm -hmm. And so that piece is a lot about that for me and having that struggle and being a working mother and trying to fit it all in. I guess for me, with intricacy, my work is what my work is. So I think Abby saw what it is and thought it would fit well. And I never really think, oh, I need to create something intricate. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just the way of my process. And so I think that's why Abby approached me in the first place. But, um, yeah, it's just a this crazy little gesture that I have, and I use it in a lot of my pieces. And uh, so I selected these four pieces because they, they really do have quite a bit of that uh, going on in them. Yeah. yeah, I kind of ditto really what Margaret says. I, I don't think I could, as I said earlier, get away from it if I tried. So <laughs> it seemed to me that we were all asked because there's an aspect of our work that embodies intricacy. And I figured that was what the invitation was for because we were already working in that vein. So it's really interesting to me to hear that some of you did not have necessarily a natural relationship with that um, with that element. Uh, for me, you know, it's it's like, yeah, it's always been there. Well, and that's interesting because I I guess I didn't think about not having it be like I never thought of it like I didn't think of that as intricate. Same thing. I didn't think you know, intricate. Yeah. But then you go, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Right. And so aesthetically, that's very intricate. And this was intentionally created for the aesthetic view, like the viewer to come in and view it from an aesthetic point of view. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why I showed the mode of production and like presenting it. There's a built frame. There's 
the mechanism that was for the yarn, the feeding of the yarn. I've hinged it on the wall so that it can be viewed from front and back and top and bottom. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not hiding the, pro the production yeah. of it all. And I wanted to show like even the arduous practice of hand punching the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just, I never thought of it as being intricate <laughs> until we were like, oh yeah, it is kind of intricate. Now that I think about it. And even the shadows coming off the wall, like there's the whole experience. And it brings to question like, what is a painting? What is a sculpture? Is this fine art or is it craft? You know, can it be fine art? Is it a performance piece? Is it left, you know, the needle, punch needle pieces on the floor? So it could have been like a production that just was left. So. Um, there is like absolutely, without a doubt, a presence of fragi fragility in mm -hmm. every collection of work in this room, um, from material to subject across the board. And I wonder if individually you guys could speak on the addition of fragility to intricacy, to your work, to content, to material, because um, it feels so present. It feels like it's so important and integral to each of your presentations of work here. Oh, well, I can definitely speak to fragility yeah. <laughs> in so many ways. Um, first of all, the materials, I mean, you know, those hands will break really, really easily. <laughs> and I deal with that all the time in my work. And since I make the cast paper pieces out of existing sculptures, and the fabric, when it dries, and I have to peel it off and get it off, of the sculpture. Sometimes, in the case of that piece back there, it tears off an arm. Mm -hmm. And then I have to go back and put it back together, the original piece that I that I used to cast the fabric from. And then in a case of that piece or that piece, it's made out of like literally a dozen tiny pieces of fabric that are then put together with little brads or um, you know, so they're just so fragile, and the fabric is so fragile, and then, you know, it wants to morph all the time. I mean, the medium is crazy, and when I first started working with it, I had no idea how to even brace it so that it would hold up, and so I've spent years just trying to get the material to retain as much motion as possible and not fall apart <laughs> or, you know, morph, and so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's like... It's like the materiality of things is so important to me that way, and that vulnerability. And, um, and you know, the breakage, I mean, it's interesting because my next series of work, as you know, um, you know, I used to work with fragility overtly in the sense of my studio was so charged with really difficult emotional, this was back in New York when I, I made work that was like literally tearing me apart, you know, that kind of thing, really, and so this work has been so much about joy and about, you know, like, 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 um, like movement and sort of human potential. But, but the next series that I anticipate doing is really going to be combining both, you know, really bringing in the fragility, but showing more of the brokenness than this has. Um, and it's, oh, I don't know, but, but that word fragility, you know, is so... Um, yes, it's another inescapable element, I would say. <laughs> Infertility for me might be, for this one, um, content-wise, is an abstract of me and my daughter having a conversation and about how I'm totally aware of my consciousness going into her without, you know, me putting my stuff on her and being very aware of that. And so this piece is more like the content itself is about vulnerability and motherhood and unsaid things, falling apart conversations, conversations that never happened. And so I think that's how that would fit into my practice a little bit. Yeah, fragility is huge for me. I mean, um, because, because so much, I mean, it ties in, I was very surprised here when I came in the amount that fragility sits within each practice. I wasn't really expecting that because it wasn't a part of the idea for the exhibition at all. Um, so the fact that all of us were women and artists and that was a presence was very fascinating to me um, that, I, that I've been sitting with as an idea. For me, it's fragility is completely associated with pain 
Um, and with my own experience living with pain between health conditions and then um, injuries. And I had gone through a period of time where I was like pretty much bedridden for an extended period of time. And so I was talking to someone um, who had had a similar um, injury regarding like their head and all that. And it was fascinating because when you can't really move, your world becomes this room and becomes this house. And so your world shrinks and you, oddly enough, when your world shrinks and you only have this much space to occupy, your world becomes extended because everything has meaning now. So the way that, so you're sitting there noticing the light on the wall and you know what time of day it is by the way that the light is hitting the wall. You know what time of day it is by the light in the springtime versus now the winter again. And so it's fascinating when, I know we've talked about your work deals with the essence of materials. And so you really start to understand how much the ordinary in your world ministers to you. And if you allow it to transform you, you can learn so many lessons from really ordinary things. And so this idea of what fragility can mean, it sits in that paradigm of being fragile and being incredibly strong. And so when you recognize that and sit in that and abide, and just the word abide, and what that means, like you start putting it in the situation of, if we're talking about domestic spheres, of an abode, and that abiding in, a, in an abode, what that means, it starts to become this spiritual realm of where you can not just exist and survive, but as much as possible in that moment, start to thrive on more of an existential level. And so when you walk out of that, hopefully, maybe not, um, you become an incredibly better person, even though you haven't been going out and conquering and doing all of these achievements, um, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity and nuance that exists, but it's, yeah, it's probably this, one of the cornerstones of my entire practice, but I did love that. I wasn't expecting for every single person to have an element of fragility when I walked in, and so that was, yeah, that's something that's been very fascinating for me. Well, with fragility, I'm yeah. having that same moment I did when I was counting the word interest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, okay. It's in there, it's in there. It's in there, but it's not something that I, again, I think, oh, I wanted to create something speaking to fragility. It's, I guess it's just there. Um, I, I'm definitely thinking about breaking and healing. Mm -hmm. and. It's obvious in things like the toothpicks and in the branch. Um, there's just a hopefulness, and I really am trying to create a sense of wonder with these everyday objects too, and an appreciation for the very simple things in life. The one thing I think about fragility um, is the power in fragility, and when you see something that's uh, I think of strength, you know, um, and what it can bear, and your words, um, you know, it's like tear, tear, tear. <laughs> uh, but all of these elements that face the fragile, and yet, the fragility, it, it's it's there, and there's it's um, exists in exquisite nature. I think um, when you have something that you you see that is so fragile, um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs>